Ladies and gentlemen, that was Audrey Flack on the screen, but that's Audrey Flack right there. And you're going to remember everything about this afternoon. Because every time I look at that thing, I, I, I think how much Audrey Flack and Rick Friedman and Cindy Lou Wakefield, who really should get some credit because that's a damn good film, how much I learn from them about art. Just walking through, just walking through that, that gallery at that time and look at it, what it looks like now. Where's Joe Diamond? What a great job they've done here at SAC to make this show look so beautiful and so bright. All set? Headset? Cool. She's all wired for sound? So my name is Charlie Riley, and I'm just the lucky guy who gets to be the one who asks a few questions and then gets you chaps to ask a few wonderful questions and make brilliant comments. Because, you know, Rick, you've got the A-team out there, too. You've got Dan Weldon, Hans van der Bovenkamp, and Joel Perlman's here. A whole bunch of hotshots are out here as well. So there better be some very, very good comments and very, very good questions. And I'm going to start off, Audrey, if I may, with a, with a quick one, which is, how does it feel now? You're in a, you're, you're, it's lit differently, it's got bright white walls. It's, it, it, does it feel different to look at it, this show now and your work up there? Maybe you want to speak. Um. I feel old. <laughs> I'm so old I can't believe it. Well, Audrey, it's taken you 70 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> Um, I feel the same. I think it was an incredible movement. I think about it all the time. I think about Jackson, I won't say every day, but a lot. And I'm still trying to figure it out. <clears throat> it's complex. It's complex. All those drips were very complex. Well, you, you actually took us through you took us through the complexity of even that work on paper in the, in the film. And yes, we should talk about the complexity of some of the art of that period. But also, one of the fascinating things is, and I think you understand it beautifully, what happens when great artists gather in one place, Florence, Paris during, in, in the, during the Jazz Age, New York at that time. What happens? What's in the water when great artists are there, in a way, pushing each other, the way, in a competitive way, pushing each other to great moments on the, on the canvas, great moments in the studio. Do you ever think about that? Is this mic good? <laughs> switch mics. Um, well, there was a lot of competition, a lot. Um, you know, I, I've been writing a book for over 40 years. It didn't start as a book. It started as <clears throat> notes for me to understand what was happening in my life because I, I hit a painting block. And I, all I could do was write for a while. Anyhow, it became a book, which is coming out. The um, <clears throat> review copies are coming out mid-December. So you'll be able to read a lot about what really went on. Um, and it's, I, I hope, I don't know about the title, but it's the title, it's called With Darkness Came Stars. Wow, what drama. do you think? Drama, wonderful. There's a lot of drama. Anyhow, I hope you read it. But, so there was competition between the women between the men, <clears throat> there was a lot between Jackson and Bill de Kooning, mm. a tremendous amount. And they were very different artists. Jackson, at one point, was not even a painter. Uh, he had become something else. When he started the drip, you know, de Kooning was painting on a canvas. He was pushing paint around. He was playing with space. He was playing with texture. He was using color. He was a painter, and he enjoyed painting. Pollock was no longer painting. Pollock was something else, and that's where the sp he became a shaman. He was in outer space, and he couldn't get back. He could not get back. Um, but it's that crazy magic that happened 
when he stopped being a painter. I think about it. <clears throat> I'm ready for some more insights, but they haven't come yet. <laughs> well, I got to say, you're, you're all going to read that book. Because that, that, that's the sort of first-hand, that's the sort of first-hand stories that we all want. And I was thinking, Rick, I'm going to ask you this one, too. There's something about it that reminds me of the great jazz musicians of the time, too. What's a virtuoso? You know, Liszt or Paganini or Rachmaninoff. I, I was looking at your work today when we got the lights back on. And there, there were these beautiful, you got to go back out. And there were these wonderful moments of texture. And there were these wonderful moments, not just of color, but that, that snap of the wrist that you were showing us in the film, right? And Rick, I was thinking also, because Rick Friedman, he knows this one really, really well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act it out first. A virtuoso, when you watch, for instance, a great ballet dancer, or when you and I watch a great athlete, a virtuoso is the guy or the woman who just does something that you can't even believe he or she just did it. Like when I was looking at your painting a moment ago, I thought, how did she get from that sort of matte feeling, that finish, to that which was shiny? And, and Rick, you're gonna recognize this. There was a baseball player one time when he heard the ball coming off the bat, he, he turned his back on home plate and ran. You know what it is, right? And ran, and he put his glove here, and the, bloody, and the ball's in it. And even he is looking at the ball in the glove and saying, how did I, how did I just do that, name? The great Willie Mays. It's the great Willie Mays, and we call it the catch. And when, and when he ran off the field, um, one of the players came to him and said, well, I, I didn't think you were going to catch that. He said, ah, I had it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's the perfect lead-in for Audrey. When a virtuoso rips it like that, and I, I've, been, I've been on the the rink when a, when a great hockey player does something. And everybody, even, in the, even the Willie Mays will say, how did I just do that? Ever have that moment? Did you ever have that moment when it, it's on the canvas and you say, how did I just do that? Here you go, Audrey. Oh, yeah, I've had that moment. And I, I tell you when I had it a lot was during photorealism. Whoa. Because I, <clears throat> it was for 10 solid years that I was, I had to be, let me talk about physical shape. I can't stand what's happening. I'm not doing, I'm not going gently. I'm angry and I'm kvetching all the time. <laughs> um, you know, I've got my ideas and I'm painting, but I can't stand up too long, I have to sit down, anyhow. But things are sharp and what I, so you, we're talking about that moment I had to be, when I was a photorealist, and also all the time, really, in terrific physical shape. I had to be like an athlete, and particularly when you use the airbrush, because one slip, and I could ruin a painting that I've been working on for eight, eight months or a year. So I was in, in exquisite control. And there was, every moment was that moment until the painting was finished. And it was like a tennis player hitting the ball in the middle yeah. of the racket where it goes ping, ping, ping. Federer. And it's, it's, Federer. It's, it's <laughs> thrilling. Cool. It's thrilling. It is, isn't it? However, <clears throat> people started to drink and have strokes and, you know, it, you pay a price for that kind of, um, and, and it was instant, it was fast, because the airbrush is fast. So that was well, also thrilling. Well, you, you know, you, you signed this thing at the museum for me, and this is, this is Albrecht Durer, Melancholia, and you were just working on, on a painting about it, melancholy. and she just talked about moving into photorealism. This is awesome. The, the way in which you change gears and then change gears again, photorealism, the paintings that you're doing about heroines right now. Rick, you and I want to talk about this today too, putting the, the, the woman warrior, the, putting the woman hero on there. But when we were looking at this together, the Durer, 
That's the kind of virtuoso I'm talking about. I mean, only Durer could make a woodblock or, or print like that. Only he could cut it. Only Leonardo could do this fumato, right? Only you could do that. And that's what I was getting at with the virtuoso thing. Like, when somebody else, because there were other photorealists who were pushing this way and you're pushing that way, how does it, you know, how do you beat them? How do you beat them at their own game? How do I beat Durer? <laughs> how do you beat, yeah, and Rubens, okay. and Titian, go ahead. Huh? Well, I'm sorry, what? Well, actually, that is part of the question too, and I did want to ask this. You have this wonderful way of looking at the whole of art history, Rubens, Titian, Albrecht Durer. I've asked my masters and mistresses. Here we go. Ah. Yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you not? How do you bypass? I mean, I think some young artists now, it's like Rembrandt who? You know, <laughs> they, don't, they don't even look. These guys, Durer is unbelievable. Durer is a cartoonist of the highest order, and he's crazy. If you really look at Durer's woodcuts and his etchings and engra his engravings, really, uh, they're wild. His imagination and his ability, he's fantastic. He happens to be somebody I'm very hooked on right now. But you have to, you have to love your, you know, I don't like to use the word masters because it's male. <laughs> I like men, I really love men, but, you know, mistresses. So, um, the right. old masters and mistresses. You actually said in, uh, in an article, uh, August 2021 in the Smithsonian Magazine. Um, I always wanted to paint like an old master, or rather, an old mistress, <laughs> a radical contemporary old mistress. So what we have here on display is not masterpieces, but mistress pieces, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So much of, of our language is, is based on, I remember Marcia Tucker, who started the new museum. She had the first consciousness raising groups in her apartment. It was on Elizabeth Street, I think. And I was in one of the first groups. And I said, I'm having a one man show. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> they came down on, would any man say he's having a one woman show? <laughs> well, you know, who thought? You didn't think, you just didn't think. So but that's, hang on, that's my turn to ask you a really big question. Rick, you've done a lot for art on Long Island, the visual arts on Long Island. But this is a, this is a statement, it was the same back in Nassau too, but you, you're making quite a powerful statement here about your view of art history, putting the women on the wall in this way. It's fantastic. Well, I have to thank uh, Cindy Lou Wakefield, who, who has given me you know, the vision and the support to do this back 17 years ago. When <laughs> Collecting, um, and you know, we started uh, with a little Elaine de Kooning uh, painting, and we hung it. And he said, "Wow, this is really great! Look at this!" You know, and then we got another one, and another one, and another one, and then and then we got you know bitten by the bug to become addictive. And oh my God, we got, and so now we so now we have a hundred pieces here uh, on display. Um, um, to follow up on um, a question here. Um, Audrey, you've defined yourself as a rebel and a feminist, and you've pioneered a lot of the women's movement in the past 70 years. Do you feel that you've been successful in now, in now raising the profile of women artists, contemporary women artists, emerging artists, even many artists that are maybe in the audience here, in helping their careers to get more visibility, more opportunity, more museum shows, more galleries? What do you think? Have you moved that needle? Are, are you happy in, in the progress that you've made, that you've seen women make in the past, even 20 years? Oh, yes, of course I'm happy. And, and for any artist, and by the way, for all the artists out there, I love you all. <laughs> We're really important for the planet. Yeah. We really are. Applause. You know, when, when you keep a level head and you don't get commodified here, here. and you really start dealing with um, truth and beauty, here, here. that's it. You know, that'll keep 
things straight a little bit. And um, so keep working. Um, do I feel, I did, <clears throat> I'm not a real activist. I do, I do it in my work. But I was active in getting Mary Cassatt, oh, yes. the first woman artist into Janssen's history of art. Not one woman artist was in any art history book in my entire education. I never saw one woman artist. And who were the first two? What? And who were the first two women artists? Well, <laughs> I, I, had, I, I, I was the second one. Who was this? Also, in the first, the, in that edition. And then first. there's, uh, you know, I, I, I did and do things that, I, I just found another woman, uh, <clears throat> a secessionist, but there was a woman artist named Luisa Roldan, and all my Macarena paintings were based on her work. She's uh, 1700s Spanish Baroque woodcarver. And I saw her work in Spain. Actually, Marsh, it was Marsha Tucker sent me a postcard. And I said, I've got to see this. What is this? She was a woodcarver, and her father was a woodcarver. <clears throat> she was better than her father, got commissions. Of course, they didn't pay her. I, I write about her in my book. Um, 500 years later, the Getty just bought her work, the Met just bought her work. She is fantastic. So it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. And Rick, you know, what I think is so exciting, particularly about this show out here, is it all happened out here. Yes, it's true. It was on, it was on 8th, 9th, and 10th Street in the Bowery, and it was at the Cedar Bar, and it was at the Artist Club, and it was in East Hampton. That's home. That's great. Yeah. And I remember, actually, somebody just interviewed me and asked me about Pollock. And I remember the day he died. And I was here, I was on Neck Path. Oh. I, I rented a little shack that was the size of this table, practically. <laughs> and they said, how did it feel? And it, it felt like, you remember when Kennedy was assassinated and the world stopped? That's how it, it felt like some terrible thing happened. Mm. You know, the whole art community was, <clears throat> we were frozen. We were, it, it's hard to describe. We knew something terrible happened when he died. And that atmosphere all over East Hampton, the word spread like wildfire. So. This is a very thrilling place to be in, too. And the show looks so beautiful over there. I, I walked in and the, the, the sun was amazing. streaming. Pardon? The show is amazing. It's, uh, the sun was streaming in. That's your, that's your light, that beautiful South Fork light streaming in, catching those colors. And that's, a, that's another question. I have a quick question for her on this. When you went, for instance, from these gorgeous pictures here, and one of them has wonderful jeweled colors, like stained glass, to photorealism, to the wonderful things you're doing now. And I remember meeting you for the first time. You were about to put this colossal statue, uh, sculpture on the East River, you know, looking right at the United Nations. Wow. This thing was gigantic. What, what, part, what part sort of goes along with you? Or, or do you do what some writers do, what some musicians do, and sort of jettison that and start anew? What comes with you? And, and, and sort of what gets left behind when you change like that? Well, I, I never stopped and started anew. It was a development, always. Mm -hmm. And there's a period between Abex and realism, certainly photorealism, that has not been contextualized. So any art historians out there, <laughs> I mean... So what, peri gonna, what it's period? It's a period like? when a lot of you know, modernism and abstract art dominated. Abstract expressionism dominated. They didn't want any representational art. Mm. And I slowly, Phil Perlstein and I sketched together. You know, there were, Alice Neal lived around the corner. Phil was around the corner. The Upper West Side had a 
bunch of artists. There were people doing representational art. You couldn't show it. Uh -huh. No gallery would show it. No museum would show it. MoMA was against it. It was all abstraction and abex. So that period when representational art comes in, you know, I did the painting I put in the night, what is it, 1956? 1956 stable show. 1956 yeah. stable show, <clears throat> which was an, a group of abstract expressionists, all the top ones, and I was invited. I was beginning to experiment, you know, they, G. Kooning, we know that he did, Woman, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know when he starts that. 57. And you, you slip Penelope in there over there. That was a fantastic painting. From a distance, you say, ah, that's, waiting, that's an abstract wait, painting. Waiting for Ulysses out there. Waiting for Ulysses. It's beautiful. It's part of that time. Well, a lot of... Which has to be looked at because it wasn't just me. There were a lot of artists. I go on from that to start using the photograph which was also condemned. That was a terrible, my friends stopped <laughs> talking to me. I lost a million friends. You, ma you laugh at it now, but it hurt. And uh, so that's how, it's not that I stopped and became something else. You know, there was a drive in me to draw like the masters, or mistresses. <laughs> and, and by the way, what happened to that painting that hung in the stable show in 1956? Wow, that's now in the Smithsonian collection. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. You could have had it, Rick. Yeah. But somehow, it's heavy. somebody represented sold it and... and right. They were after it right. and okay. they... It's called yeah. Lady with a Pink. Lady with a Pink, right. Um, so um, let's talk, let's fast forward a little bit into the world of heroic women and goddesses. Fast forward, and uh, you're sort of reinventing yourself again, if I may, and really making a lot of noise. I think you're going to. I think Hollis Taggart, uh, Tommy's going to have a, a show for you uh, coming up March, April. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, there'll be a show. And, and I think it's opening March 21st. March 21st. To which you're all invited Let's, to see um, my new work, which is called Post Pop Baroque. Post Pop Baroque. <laughs> And it's all of the above. And, and it really is mythical figures and, and, and you sort of transform from photorealism to mystical, magical figures. Really? Goddesses, right? Basically. I never thought of it <laughs> well, that way. That's pretty cool that you did that. And, and what do you say, um, they are not yet idolized, the goddess in every woman? Rick, it's not that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I am, I have to tell you, I, when I had my studio on 8th Street, <clears throat> in a condemned building, the banister, the stairway was tilted, the floors were rotted, and it was cheap. And there was a hole in the middle of my floor was all rotted out and I could look down on the third floor does anybody know John Grillo yeah, yeah sure wonderful he was on the third I was on the second on the first <clears throat> was a, an artist that inked spider-man <laughs> and when he had too much work and couldn't do it I would ink spider-man oh, cool. <laughs> oh. um, but I'm looking at a lot of comics now I think there are a lot of unsung, unsung, terrific artists. Um, and that has gotten into my work. Um, and, they, and the audience loves it. When we, we, I had you twice at the museum, and the second was The Supernatural. And it was right in that room, and I remember every single, we have these yellow school buses that come in, it's like LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> And thousands of little kids come in every single, and they would go right to, was it, uh, not Catwoman's. Uh, uh, well, well, oh, it was Melancholia. Where's Ma Madeline? Yeah, Melancholia, but there were two, we had two. 
Where's Madeline? She'll remember it. And all the kids, not just oh, yeah. the. Oh, not just oh the, that was Superman. Super, that was Superman. Uh, Superman. Superman kissing a Hawaiian woman. And, and, and you know what? They, they, they glommed onto this thing, and it was just fantastic. And Audrey Flack, this is our way of saying, my way of saying, the kids loved it. So you're reaching one generation, another generation, and another generation. It's, it's marvelous when you think of it. They, you, you found that way that art needs, and I love the ending of your film, Cindy Lou Wakefield, your film and yours, Ricky, be, I, when you said it nourishes. Because she also said something that this afternoon I'm gonna remember forever, which is that is when art really nourishes us. I've seen what your work does for the kids, and for people like me, and for the people who came out here this afternoon to tell you how much they love your work. Well, thank you, that's very nice. I, I didn't know that, but I'm glad. You know, these, these, these comic book heroes and heroines are the new Greek gods and goddesses. <laughs> I do not know what the young people know, but they have like Superman has a father and a mother, and ma many of them, the X-Men have sisters and brothers, and they, are, they have stories. Yeah. I'm working on a painting that I'm really excited about. It's, um, does anybody in the audience, and I can't see you, does anybody know Magneto? Oh, a couple. Ah, okay. well, I never heard of Magneto. Well, it started because a collector, that's a whole idea, <laughs> other thing. He wanted me to do a Doctor Strange, and I got fascinated with Doctor Strange. Uh, these people are interesting. Doctor Strange was a very successful surgeon who made a lot of money and had a very big ego but he didn't really have a, a full heart, and he was very arrogant, and he got into a car accident, crushed his hands, and he was very upset, of course, and he resorts to go to the Far East and study with yogis and spiritualists, and he becomes a much better person, and he learns to fly in and out of dimensions of space and help the world. I'm making it very short. <laughs> so he intrigued me. And, and these mythological stories are not unlike Zeus, who is a rapist, by the way. That's another one of my lives. <laughs> uh, but they're much better than a lot of the Greek myths. So now, I find out about Magneto. Who is Magneto? He's one of the X-Men, very powerful, very strong. Long story, I'm not gonna go into it, but I found out Magneto was in Auschwitz. How do you like that? Magneto is a Jewish X-Men. Shocking. And he doesn't look like Woody Allen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities of dealing with these comic heroes and heroines. And I've, you know, we know Wonder Woman. I've done Wonder Woman. There are many more. But there are new, there are new gods and goddesses. And they speak to the generations before me. So if you could put them into the realm of fine art, Durer does it, right? Yeah. right? Sure. You look at Durer carefully beyond the Christ figure on the cross, and you see the demons. I mean, they make Ironis and Shabash look like nothing, right? Yes. You got the eyes in her, yeah. in the melancholia. Oh, it was scary. It was a marvelous painting, too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you ready for a few questions from this attractive audience? You know, you get, when, when you've, when, if Vermeer would, would never be able to answer questions up here. For one thing, he wasn't very talkative. But we don't have Vermeer, we have Audrey Flack. And when you have the, you have the artist right there in the studio or in the, 
in the Art Center, when, you've, when you're ready to ask her a question, don't miss the opportunity. I mean, take, take this up, and, and by the way, if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna call on some of you, because I know you. So who's got, who's got some questions for Audrey Flack? Ah, Harvey Mattis, of course, wants a shot. Go, Harvey. Uh, it's so nice uh, having you here, and uh, Rick, great show, and, and Charlie, nice to see you again. Anyway, you, uh, Audrey, you say you love artists. You have a great love for artists, especially the artists in the audience. Harvey Mattis. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering, do you have any feelings for art collectors? <laughs> because I'm not an artist, but I'm an art collector. He needs a little love. And I and I have two pieces that you painted, and I love them. So, do you have any fond feelings for art collectors? That's my question. <laughs> do I have any words for art collectors? Nice words. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I mean, I'm a collector. Uh, whatever I can get, I actually bought a Bouguereau when nobody wanted Bouguereau. Do you know Bouguereau? Bouguereau was very famous in, in, in the 1900s and very expensive, and then he went out of favor. But he's a great artist, I always So artists collect when they can and what they can. Um, I think collectors are really fascinating. Lewis is a collector. I know he's a great collector. Um, and long may they live. What I don't like, I'll tell you what I don't like, collectors who are collecting as investment, as a commodity of something they'll buy and put in a vault and not even look at it. <laughs> now, that is not what art is about, and it never should be. And also this kind of herd mentality. If a certain gallery says you should buy it, or a certain critic, or I don't know what, says, oh, this is it, and this is the hottest, latest, newest 20-year-old that hasn't even developed. I don't like that. And I don't like collectors that do that. So I would wipe that out. Maybe, maybe I should say you shouldn't collect until you know a little art history, until you've looked a little, until you've suffered a little, until you know what art really is. There. Brava. Another question over here. Otherwise, I love collectors. You know, you need collectors. You need collectors to keep you going. Audrey, Audrey, yeah. Audrey. I'm over here, Lou. So, so this is the great Lou, Lou, oh, Lou, Lou Meisel, great, one of the great uh, gallerists in just, America, just, and a legend, a pioneer that just, created just the realism genre. Just a couple of words. Lou I, is one of the great art dealers. I, 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 it's Audrey, still alive. I did, I did a lecture about two weeks ago, and it was supposed to be on collecting. And I started it off by saying there are two words that have opposite meanings, and you have to know these words before you begin. One of them is accumulating. The other one is collecting. There's an accumulation and there's a collection. And there are certain people that accumulate without understanding what they're doing because of all sorts of reasons. Um, I have a million things to say, but I'm gonna say one more thing that didn't come up yet, but in the fall, in October, at the Parish Museum, Audrey's having a show. And it's called Now and Then. So the first room is gonna be the new paintings now and the second room is going to be the paintings that you're seeing here from wow. the abstract period. It's you know great. that, right? Well, I'm, no, I didn't know that. Of course you but, did. We've been talking about it for No, the last... but I didn't know it was abstract work till no, now. No, the show is called Now and Then. When is that show going to When is it's that show planned? It's going to open in October and it'll be running for about 3 or 4 months oh. and we're actually coming to your studio <laughs> on Tuesday to choose the old paintings. <laughs> Anyway, there's a wonderful movie and a wonderful talk, and I'm absolutely amazed, and I've known you for 60 years, and I'm always amazed. Thank you, Mr. Mizell. Uh, That's Lou Mizell, everyone. Any more questions? Come on. Here we go. Thanks so much for sharing uh, the brilliance of your career and your experiences, particularly in this uh, time in the 50s, when it was so difficult for a female, um, especially in such a, 
a, a, a masculine field of abstract expressionism. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share um, any reminiscences or um, opinions about Helen Frankenthaler, who one could argue became more known or famous um, than perhaps her contemporaries. Hmm, oh boy. <laughs> I like to stay away from that one. <laughs> you know, I um, I was I was really friendly with with Grace and um, and Elaine. Does anybody remember Eddie's luncheonette? Yeah. Elaine and I used to go to Eddie's luncheonette. It was a hole in the wall on Main Street, right? And Eddie had Coke bottle glasses. Um, oh. You know, I have certain uh, I don't like to say this. You know, she she um she hung out with Clement Greenberg who slapped her around by the way. You know, she put up with stuff too. That's in my book. Uh and then she went to Motherwell. And there was a lot of talk amongst the women, certainly I think Louise Nevelson hated her, that she, she used that, she used that to get herself somewhere. Her paintings have to be judged for themselves. I, I don't want to say any more. I was never close with her. She was very wealthy. All right. I'll tell you one funny quote. <laughs> I had an internist, a doc, my, my doctor. He was a very good doctor. He was really a wonderful doctor. We knew him outside of his profession, and then he became our family doctor. But he was a doctor to Al Pacino, and uh, Spencer Tracy, and he was really great. I would walk in and he would know what was wrong. I wouldn't have to say anything. Well, Helen Frankenthaler wanted him to be her doctor. And Helen Frankenthaler, because we shared a, an assistant, a very sweet, young, unassuming woman who Helen drove her crazy. Helen was very particular, and she would plan dinner parties, and she, <laughs> who was going to sit next to who, and, you know, it was all plotted. Not that, you know, I can understand doing that, but she went to extremes and had her measure. She wanted these little Gershkin pickles and had her measure them with a ruler. Anyhow, <laughs> that, that poor little assistant quit, but <laughs> Helen had migraines every day and wanted this doctor to treat her exclusively like she wanted the minute she called he should drop all his other pain of course he's not going to do that and she offered him work he didn't want to do that he was a respectable doctor and all right i'm going to tell you <laughs> they word in <laughs> The word was, they called them motherfucker and Frankenstein. <laughs> That's a little um, tidbit. On that the price oh, of admission. <laughs> on that note, any, here, I got a question right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, uh, so nice to meet you. Um, who is this? I can't see who I'm anybody. right in the center aisle, right here. Where? Oh, in the center, okay. Oh, I'm right in the center aisle. Um, last night I was looking at examples of your photorealism, and I was really caught by it. It's wonderful. But I, I thought of something last night. What would you think of photography that was made to look like paintings. Photography that was made to look like paintings. Oh. The other way around. You know, that's a big, what do I think of photography too? 
Yeah. It's a huge question. Yeah. You mean like with this AI that they can do all kinds of things, right? Well, this wouldn't be AI. It would just be an amateur photographer like myself um, making photographs that, that look like, let's say, impressionism or taking a waterfall and getting into like the very molecules of the water and then displaying them in art shows, which I've done. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts. It's a very big question because are you talking about what um, using special cameras that no. can magnify? Well, no, but not really, no. I just have a little camera which I'm wearing right now and I just shoot by instinct and... Um, I'm not sure I get what you mean because you can have... Um, you can set up a, a, uh, an image after a painting, let's say after an old master painting, you could set up uh, something that looks like a Vermeer, women holding a, a picture and photograph it. So I think we have to put your question aside because it's huge. Thanks. How about, here, how about one here? Did you have a question? Okay. Hey. Oh, wait, that's Joel Perlman. He's a hot shot. <laughs> Here you go, Joel. How can I follow that? Um, Audrey, here's an easy question. Who is, who is Joel? Joel Perlman. Oh, Joel, hi. An uh, artist. Another artist. Sculptor. Wonderful. The great sculptors in the Hamptons. Um, when did you start doing the goddess sculptures? Um, oh, my goddess sculptures. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've been in the shadow of them many times, including, I think, in Lewis's garden, and there's always this gorgeous goddess sort of looking down on my sculpture. Um, so I've always admired those and the scale of them. So when did you start and how do you do them that big? I see you up on a ladder and, um, so and that's really something we haven't touched on yet that I've always been fascinated about. And self-taught sculptor, right? You're a self-taught self sculptor? Well, I, I had a couple of sculpture classes in school, but no, yeah. Well, that's good. By the way, I don't know if anybody knows or everybody knows that Lou Mizell has a sculpture garden which is open to the public in Sagaponic, which is marvelous. And it's quite a gift to the community. It is, yeah. yeah. Oh, Louis, do you want to tell anybody exactly where it is? Because anybody can go, and there's a, a yeah. major work of mine there. Well, maybe you don't even know this, but I have recently. I'm on the board of the parish. I've told them that I'm going to donate that field in Sagaponic, two acres on uh, Wilkes Lane, to the parish with all the sculpture on it, that they should show it. That, that, that they should show it as it is for five years, after which they can bring any of the sculpture they want to the parish. Uh, they can give some to their donors or board members, and then they'll eventually be able to sell the lot, which will be, by a factor of five, the biggest donations they ever had, and will sustain them for the next 30 or 40 years. <laughs> and dead, dead, dead center is your Rock Hill goddess. That was politically incorrect, so we en ended up naming it Sibitas, and that's the goddess, the first goddess. And to answer the question, because you may not even know it, but my son was born in 1984. And a year later, uh, in 82, I'm sorry, and a, a year later, you gave me a small statue of, uh, of an angel, about two feet high. That's where it is. And, and wait I a second. I knew I made two. <laughs> I forgot. OK, so that was a, a, a birth present. But it was clay, and I said, can I have it cast in something that will last? And six months later, you came in and you saw it in bronze, and you said, I'm going to be a sculptor. Now, I had just finished showing and selling 40 major photorealist paintings, and for six years, there was nothing. You just disappeared and learned to be a sculptor. And then you've done some many really major pieces of sculpture. Um, we talked about the statue that was supposed to be on Queens Waterfront, 
What's left of it is the hands, and they're in the sculpture field also. Anyway, everybody is welcome. It's open 24-7, and we'll continue to be that way. Getting a workout here. Congratulations. I've admired your work for many, many years. And who, who are you? Lillian Heidenberg. Hi. Hi. I'm a collector and also an art dealer. But I want to know what you're most proud of in your long career. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's a hard question. You know, I mean, in, in Abex, there are things. In photorealism, there are things. They're, you know, they're my babies. You're going to say, which one do you like better? I will. Um, I think the artists here will know, maybe everybody in your own field, when you do something good, you know it. And when you do something bad, you also know it. And you do something that's good, but not quite so good. But when you hit what I call a masterpiece, and I'm not talking from ego, I'm talking from just reality, you know it because the work starts vibrating, it starts singing, Every, everything is right. This area works with that area, and, the, and that's why masterpieces are masterpieces. They last for hundreds of years, and they, we stand before them because everything in it is working. And when you're an artist and you hit it, you know it, and it's, you're usually alone, and it might be three in the morning that you're finally working something out and it's not like you're a Hollywood star on television and everybody's applauding you. You're alone. You gotta have your 15th cup of coffee. And, um, but you know it. So there are, <clears throat> I think the Vanitas paintings, my World War II, and one that is here that Lewis donated to the parish very generously, uh, Wheel of Fortune yeah. and Marilyn. The other two are in other museums, but I hit it with that, I I kn and I knew it, I knew it. Those, those are uh, paintings that go beyond, beyond. And there are other things, but I think all of us artists know and I guess when you're a business person, you know when you make a great deal, right? <laughs> so, what uh, about the, um, the Queen of Hearts? Is that where there was a, a, a documentary made and uh, I think a, uh, a painting was donated. Lou, did you donate the painting to the yeah. Smithsonian? Smithsonian? Smithsonian. Yeah. Which is painted on the stairwell. Right. The front it's painted on the front steps of the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. Is that where it is, Lou? Is that incredible? Yes. I'll tell you what happens when you get as old as me. <laughs> I didn't even go to the Smithsonian. I mean, I, I wanted to, but my back hurt. <laughs> and then something else hurt. And you know, if, in a way, you see more clearly, because you see what's really important. You don't give a damn what you say a lot. Who cares, right? I mean, in eight years, I will be a real antique. I'll be a hundred, I'll be a hundred, if I live that long. So you deal with mortality. And art, Art, I feel, for all of us human beings, that's why it's so important. It deals with immortality. Art helps us live in this veil of tears that we live in. You know, we're, um, Shakyamuni Buddha said, you know, this is nothing but suffering. And there are wonderful other things, yes. But life knocks you around, and certainly knocked me around. And how did I get off on this? I, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't know if I'll have the energy, because I really want to finish Magneto, and I've got a lot of, of my new work to do. 
but I'm thinking of interviewing artists who are old. You know, what happens to your color? What happens to your thoughts? What do you want to say? And what do you want to do? It's interesting. My colors are getting lighter. Bryce Martin got darker. Um, Rothko got darker. Rothko got darker, de Kooning got lighter. So, what's it all about is what you're really dealing with. And um, <clears throat> I think the essence of art is what's it all about. Audrey, hello. It's uh, Roz Diamond here. I'm over here on your left a little bit. Okay. And thank you so much. It's so great to hear your frank, fresh words. Um, as a woman who's just been inducted into NAWA, National Association of Women Artists, that I know you're part of, um, I'm just proud to be uh, a woman artist. And, and, and I would like, to, my question is, you spoke about those wonderful days you had. And you said, it's not like now. And um, it certainly has changed a lot. And I wonder what your advice would be to women artists and artists in general, given the, the scenario we have now. I'm very involved in the digital scene. It's very exciting. At the same time, it's also thrown a real wrench into the art world as we know it. So I just wonder what you would say to young artists. I think you may have already answered this question a bit about the eternal masterpieces, the things that happen in your own studio. But just what, what would you say to give uh, young women artists, or older too, advice as to how to navigate the situation we're in today, and politically as well? That might be too big. Advi <laughs> ad advice to artists today. Well, it's, artists it's today. hard, you know. In, in the era of abstract expressionism, all of that work, we really didn't think about money at all. We really did. You wanted to pay the rent, and you wanted to eat. Uh, none of us had money, but you weren't thinking about selling the way it is now. It just was not in the air, and it's become crazy. You know, I read the Christie's auction things. Crazy. Crazy. Thank you so much. That's so true. And I would love to hear you play the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to do your work and you have to yeah. keep your standards up, whatever your standards are, and times change and styles change. And there are new colors coming out. I happen to like some of the fluorescent colors that are coming out. So you deal with all of that, but you have your own integrity. And whether you believe in art as Old, old masters and mistresses, which I do, and drawing and skill, or whether you don't, you know? Uh, you have to see through it all. You have to think about it and decide what makes your life worthwhile. Thank you. And we're just starting to learn about Artemisia Genileschi and how many years has that been? That's even further, 1500s, so thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Kim, and I want to ask you if everyone, anyone ever called your photorealistic, um, I'm back here. Where are you? Back here in the corner. Okay, hi. Okay. So did anyone ever call you an illustrator? Well, they looked down upon, uh, you know, Chuck Close and I were the first ones that used the airbrush. Lewis, who else was using the airbrush? Richard refused. Ben Johnson. Ben was using the airbrush, yeah. Did Don use it? Yeah. But this was earlier, because they're a little younger. And we were considered, uh, the only people that were using the airbrush then were lowly illustrators <laughs> and uh, art retouchers. And you shouldn't do it. I don't remember any. Did anybody call me an illustrator? No. no. <laughs> but I am. And so is Durer. What's wrong with that, you know? Anyhow, I can't tell you the other things I've been called. <laughs> A lot. 
Hi. Hi, Audrey. It's me, Vered. Vered. Oh, Vered how Gallery. are you, Vered? Hi, I haven't seen you for so long. It's so great to see you, Rick and Louie and you, and all the people that we shared so many wonderful years here. And we were part of this great place. And you were so amazing all the years. Not only you great artists, you also know how to talk. And that <laughs> always helps. You are so enlightening. And just want to say thank you. Oh, Verit, thank you. You know, Verit, Verit had a panel at her gallery and, uh, with Larry Rivers and me. And who else was on that? Do you remember? Verit? You had a panel on feminism or women in art. And I remember Larry was basically disgusting. <laughs> he was such a misogynist. And, oh, and it had something to do with the photographs that he took of his young developing daughters naked. And um, I remember getting very angry at Larry but they cut it out of the film. But I, uh, there's some words I said, but you were very brave enough to do that in your gallery. Well, the name of the show was Nude or Naked. <laughs> Nude or Naked. Well, you did some great things, Ruth. I'll tell you, yeah, we want to thank you for being a pioneer in the Hamptons here in East Hampton and championing art, local artists for many, many years. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Rick. It convinced us to be collectors, so uh, thank you for inspiring me to. I'll collect. tell you, Rick, you and Cindy Lou and Joe Diamond, you really brought the A team here, and I've got one here at the back of the room that would like to say something Hans van der Bovenkamp. Oh, oh Hans, where are oh, you, Hans? Boy. We're filled with legends here today. Where are you? Not here. Well, how is your toe? You had hurt your toe last time I saw you. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> uh, Audrey, this is not a question. This is a compliment and gratitude. About 15, 20 years ago, uh, you and I met somewhere, and we went for an art walk. We walked, I don't know if you recall it, but we walked through about a dozen galleries, and uh, you were the first artist I worked with, and you pointed out, you said, about this painting that, and about that painting that, and about this sculpture. And those three or four hours you and I spent together was like having 50 years of education. Uh, oh, sorry. 50 years of education about art, and not saying, you know, I just like it, but the reason why you like it, or the reason why you don't like it, so you have an, a, a preconceived image of something that you hope to see. So uh, you are very generous. And I'm a great admirer of yours. And I hope you are around for another 10, 20 years. Thank you very much, Hans. One more. I hope so. I hope so. Hans Ben Vomikamp is a great uh, sculptor. Four questions. One of my back here. Yes. Over here. Oh, we got one here. Yes, Audrey, it's Tony Brandt. Where are you? I'm here against the wall. Uh huh. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something that I should have asked you the other day when I saw you, and that is the, your attraction to Durer. Because I know about it. You've done you've done some pictures that are, that could be Durers that have that impression. And I'm wondering where it comes from. Ah, that's a good question. You know, I think, first of all, we're attracted to different artists at different times in our lives. But I think there's, there are certain core um, things inside of us. I love that Germanic line. I love that incised line, you know, and, and his woodcuts. I love them. 
So I think there's something, but I also love his ability to draw and his imagination. Um, I think that's in me. What's also in me is a love of Spanish Baroque passion things, those sculptures by Luis Roldan and by Spanish passion artists. So I think in each of us, somebody might love Van Gogh, somebody might love my friend Harold, who's a wonderful painter, he loves Bonard. I like Bonard, I'm not crazy about Bonard. He doesn't, he doesn't speak to me the way Durer, and thank you for that Durer book you gave me once. Um, so I think each of you, if you think in your own minds, who, who speaks to you deeply. I remember the first time I was in high school, I knew no women artists and music and art, and there was a Mary Cassatt postcard that the teacher tacked up on the wall. Be still my heart. <laughs> I didn't know who she was. I didn't know I was supposed to like her or not like her, but it moved me. I love Mary Cassatt, but I don't love her the way I love Durer because Durer is another part of me. There's an artist named Carlo Crivelli. You should all go to the second floor of the Met. It's closed now for renovation, but they have a couple of Carlo Crivellis that I discovered when I'm 14. Who the hell is Carlo Crivelli? 15th century Venetian nutcase <laughs> who is such an exquisite painter. And uh, I wrote an article on him 35, 40 years ago. It got published in a Crivelli recently. Um, but he's beautiful. He also has that line. So. You know, um, Durer nice. carved into the woodblocks when he was carving lines that would never be printed. I always loved that. It's almost Did like he? Bach and the Gold. Tell me, tell me. Lines that he knew would never be printed, but when we have the woodblock, you can see, we wouldn't, but we could see with a magnifying glass those lines that he left in there. Talk about a virtuoso. I mean, it's just like Bach. There were notes that he knew no harpsichord or organ could play, but he would put them in the score because he would think, okay, later somebody named Steinway is going to create a piano like that. Any more questions? Here, here we go. By the way, Harvey Maines, there's a Durer in your painting. That's correct, yes, I love it. Yep. And there's this, in a new painting I've done, is covered with Durer all around. Drawings. Oh, delicious. Hello. Um, Hi. Are there any young female artists that you feel get it, that you follow? Oh my. Oh my. I'm not into that now. You know, I'm in survival mode. <laughs> and that's another mode. And, and that means going around and looking and evaluating. That's another period of time in one's life. I don't think that's not, that's not where I am, you know. I have to conserve energy. I have to use a cane, you know, and complain a lot. So I think to do justice to that, I, I am aware of a lot of, a lot of the young women artists. I'm quite aware of their work. Some I think are grossly overrated because they're women. And I think there are a lot of male artists that are just as good and better that are getting no attention because they're men. That's not fair, but I think there are some very good ones. But I don't, I don't want to go further than that. If I can follow that up then, is there any that you thought many years ago got it, but didn't, but we don't know about them? New discoveries, are there, are there, are there artists from the 50s and 60s and 70s that may have been passed over that maybe should have their time? That were terrific. They were terrific that have been undervalued and overlooked. That there probably are that were good, but I think anybody that was really that great got known. And now coming to the plate, Rick, because you got the all-star team, 
Dan Weldon, who's taught oh. a lot of people in this room how to make oh, a print. Oh, Dan. Dan, I wanted to write you a note, and I don't know if it ever went through because sometimes I don't do the computer well, but well, okay. I wanted to congratulate you on some show or other that you were doing and some great work that you do. Thank you very, very much, Audrey. Thank You're you. Welcome. Uh, but today is about you. <laughs> and uh, you are terrific. You are so fantastic, fantastic, warm, filled with love. Thank you. Uh, before I ask my question to you, I wanted to acknowledge how I feel about Albrecht Dürer because I just got a new press and uh, Eric Fischel christened it. The name of my press is Albrecht. Is what? Al, Al, Albre Albrecht, Albrecht Dürer. Really? He, that's the name of my press. But No kidding, <laughs> that is fabulous. It's a, it's a very beautiful press. and. Um, but my question to you is actually very interesting because, or for me, I'm curious about the competition that you were talking about at the time between the people that were really the first abstract expressionists and you were there. Uh, could you tell, explain that a little bit, what you felt about that competition between those artists? Between the Abex artists? Yes. At the time, I don't know if we were that aware of it at the time. You know, they, they worked alone in their studios. I don't think Pollock and de Kooning didn't hang out. None of them, they didn't hang out with each other. And the women didn't hang out with each other. I mean, they got together at the club, and the, at the club mainly, at the Cedar Bar, I don't think de Kooning and Pollock ever drank together at the Cedar Bar. Um, I'm not going to tell you now, but there is a great story of, about the competition between Jackson and Bill de Kooning in my book. <laughs> it is a great story. I'm not going to tell you. I told you a lot, but, um, yeah, and there's more about Elaine and, um, and Lee. There was a lot of competition there, a lot, because they were fighting for their men to be first. Who was going to take first place? So that's in the book, too. There's a lot more. Anyhow, Dan, maybe we'll work together sometime. Be nice. Um, first of all, thank you. This has been an amazing talk, and I can't wait to read the book. But in the film, you talk a little bit about the relationship when you were talking about the line and your relationship to the canvas and how the artist feels that, that connection. And you've worked in so many... Could you hold the Sorry, mic okay. a little? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, better. Um, you, in the film, you talk a little bit about the relationship of the line and the artist with the canvas, and you were saying that, you know, that's perceptible to the viewer. And you've worked in, in other mediums since then, right? Doing, that was one of your early works, talking about photorealism using an airbrush or doing sculpture. And can you talk a little bit about the relationship for you? Is that different, working on canvas, and how that, how you sort of sense that in using an airbrush or a sculpture? Is the sort of tactile, visceral experience different with you and how you express your work and your meaning in your, in your art? Oh, let me get that. You got that? So the difference between <laughs> sculpture and, 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 and Well, canvas. you're talking about line. Talking about line, but also the, the experience for the artist in working in line and then for you in working then with an airbrush or different tools and how that affects your well, ability. Well, interesting, to it's, it's a really good question because while I, I love to draw and believe in drawing and I'm drawing, with, the, with photorealism, I wanted to eliminate line. I was very interested in form. For instance, there is no line in nature. If I take my arm and I put it out here, like this, there's no line. My arm is form 
interrupting space. There is no line. There is nothing that's drawn like that. Each finger is a form. So I was using that. You know, photorealism is, is complex. Not by all the artists. But it's not just using a photograph. I, mean, I was studying light and how it bounced off various surfaces. And I was, I had my theories about line. Is there line in sculpture? So it, it moved and it changed. And you know, now I'm very interested in line with Albert Durer because he's all line. So, you know, what is life? It's a mess. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of things, line, no line, form, but it, it's, it's fascinating, you know? It's fascinating. Are you up for a couple more questions? I guess, yeah. A couple more questions? Yes. <laughs> How come on the South Fork, all the questions are so good and the people are so attractive? It's amazing. We don't have this in, in Rawson. Who's got another question, another comment? Over there. I'd like you to tell me, please, the demise of the queen. What happened to her? Oh. You're talking about the sculpture that was supposed to go into the East, uh, yeah. East River. Um, yeah. No. Well, it was the first statue that got pulled down because of political controversy. You know, some, somebody, somebody will write about it, that it was the first, but it was so long ago. You know, now they're taking down sculptures that have anything to do with slavery or with anything politically incorrect. And this statue was commissioned by Portugal. I won an international competition, and I was so happy. I was really happy, because I could put my dream out there. I wanted to put a woman. I didn't want to have women looking up at a general, you know, on a horseback with one breast hanging out. <laughs> I wanted to put a powerful, wonderful woman out there, and here was an opportunity. And it, it, I, here I won. And Portugal wanted to give this statue to the United States the way the French gave the Statue of Liberty. And it was going to be almost as big a Statue of Liberty. Can you imagine your dream as a sculptor? And my dream as a, a feminist. And I, and I wanted her to be beautiful and I wanted her to represent every nationality, every race, and I work like hell, changing the face constantly to get a, a composite, a universal face. I was aware of all that. And I worked on it for years. And when you do something that big, you take it up in scale, right? I've got a four foot one in the studio. Um, you do- one in Lisbon, isn't there one in Lisbon, Spain? What? Isn't there one in Lisbon, Spain? There's one in Lisbon, yes. There's Audrey, one in Spain, and that's sort of... A, Audrey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you on this. Lou, it's Lou again. Yeah, Lou. Um, after several rounds, she was chosen to do this sculpture. It was offered to America by a group of wealthy British, no. Portuguese people, oh. because Queen Catherine was the princess, the daughter of the King of Portugal. She married the King of England when England acquired New York, and Queens was named for her. Right. And the statue was supposed to be across from the United Nations on the Queens waterfront. And there were five finalists. This was amusing. The, uh, the final event to choose the winner was at the Plaza Hotel, and Donald Trump was the master of ceremonies. I remember that. At any rate, she got it, and she built it, and I have some pictures of it. Unfortunately, we can't show them here, but when, Queen, uh, when uh, Claire Kaufman, 
the Queens Borough President, was supposed to designate and donate and give us the acre of land, there was a, a big audium, auditorium full of people, people, and Al Sharpton arrived with a crowd of protesters, his protesters, who yelled and screamed and ran around and said, we cannot have this in America because the King of Portugal and the King of England presided over countries that dealt in slavery. And the peace then went out to Allentown, Pennsylvania, where it laid around for about six years and was melted down. And all that's left of it is the hands that are in the sculpture field and will eventually be at the Parish Museum. Wow, sorry. Yeah, the borough, it's interesting that the borough of Queens was named after. She became Queen of England um, for a brief period. And she was very kind, I looked her up. She was a very kind, good, sweet person who'd never owned slaves. But because Portugal had slaves in the 17th century, it got cut down. And my work, can you imagine having your work melted? What a loss to New York and America, huh? It is, because I, had, I have black family. My mother's sister, who is very, very white-skinned, very Jewish, marries a very black man. So I have three of the most beautiful caramel-colored cousins. And my cousin Karen, I have pictures of her posing for this face that I was trying to get. And I remember the piece was shown, photographs were shown by this reporter who cracked the story about Al Sharpton. And she took it to schools in Queens that were mainly black. The kids loved it. All the students loved it. It was beautiful. Well, listen, thank you to the Southampton Art Center. This has been fantastic. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Mizell. Thank you, Harvey Manis. Thank you very much, Rick Friedman and Cindy Lou Wakefield. And thank you, Audrey Flack. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>